Good morning and welcome to the Arbor Church. If you're here for the first time or if you need to update your information, fill out the Connect card on our church app. If you're new here, stop by a Welcome Center for a free gift. Start the year off right by getting in the Word daily with a Bible reading plan. You can find some of our recommendations on the Arbor Church app by selecting the Reading tab on the homepage. Be on the lookout for more details about an upcoming worship night on Friday, January 28th. Don't forget, sign-ups for the Pickleball Tournament fundraiser are now open. Visit safmc.me slash pickleball to register. The cost to enter the tournament is $30 per person, and if you enter more than one bracket, it will be $10 for each additional entry. All proceeds go towards the Student Ministry Youth Conference. For more information on all of the upcoming events and church happenings, check out the church app or website. I'm Alyssa, and I'm so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Good morning, church. Psalm 24 says, Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Stand and worship together this morning.
seated. As we prepare for the offering this morning, we always put a slide up that shows you the various ways that you can give. And uh, you obviously notice that that has changed over the last few years. Giving uh, patterns and methodology has changed, and that's by necessity. What I find interesting about our church in giving, in uh, faithfulness in this area, is that that didn't change. So, uh, Despite the change in methods in giving, people have continued to keep that commitment with God strong, and that's a great sign for the spiritual life of a church. And that's great for the ministry of our church, but there is also a mission that takes place outside the walls, and that too is a, is a, has great indicators of health in the life of our church. You remember as we were closing out 2021 and uh, by the way, our 2021 giving was very strong, finished strong, and helped us to hit uh, our goals. But uh, in addition to that, we have a tradition around here called the Jesus Birthday Offering. And that offering is for others outside the walls of our church. And you once again responded in a great way. That offering was just a few dollars short of being $20,000 for others. So uh, praise the Lord for our faithfulness. Yes, absolutely. So as we give today, remember 
Not only we have a ministry of our church, but a mission to others, and we're making a great difference. Uh, I know these are challenging days, but your giving is making an even greater difference in the environment that we're in right now. So thank you in advance for your 2022 commitment. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We can't even imagine the ways that you're faithful that we can't see. But in the ways that we do see and we do experience, we're so grateful for how you meet the needs of our lives and you meet the needs of lives uh, uh, all around us. Lives that are on the other side of the world, you meet through our resources. In prompting us to give, you meet the needs of many around us. And it's not just about finance. Although that's important, it allows us the opportunity to embolden the message that we share. Thank you for using us the way you do, and thank you for the Arbor Church and for the mission that you've given us. When we think about bringing abundant life in the community, we know that abundant life has a name, and it's Jesus. So would you live in us, minister through us, and may one day we stand on the other side and look back and realize that you were doing much more than our eyes could see, and we give you thanks for all of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. It's good to have you here for worship today at the Arbor Church. I'm so glad that you're with me and we are together today. If you're new or you're visiting, we just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here. We have a gift for you, actually, if you go out to the Welcome Center and we want to answer any questions you have about the community here at the Arbor and how we can get you connected. So we are jumping into a new series called Eat This Book, and several people have asked me about this series, this title. Can you go back to the slide, this slide? So just for a second, what words or thoughts come to mind when you see that graphic with that title? Tell somebody beside you. Some of you are like, nope, I'm not talking. So I look at that, and it evokes words like hungry, like community, because there's all these people together, like reaching or seeking. I also look at that, and I see, well, they've got their utensils, so they're equipped. Do these words like hungry, reaching, community, and seeking describe your relationship with God and his word? because that's what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. I want us to enter into this time with faith and expectancy about the power of God's word. We just sang it. Every word he speaks is life to us. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you and we acknowledge you as the Lord. We're so grateful, God, to be able to know you and to worship you. And Lord, we are so grateful for your word. It's how we know who you are. Your word is the story of redemption, and your word is this revelation of Jesus, our Messiah. And your word is an invitation to us to be a part of that story. So Lord, today as we enter in, I pray especially For everyone in this room and everyone watching online, that God, you would raise our expectancy, that you would strengthen our faith around the power of your word, that, Lord, you would help us develop new patterns and new habits that strengthen us in your word, that form us in your word, and that bring your hope to others through us. Holy Spirit, would you be our teacher in this time? And I pray for everyone sitting out here that, Lord, we would release the other things on our mind and that we would open our ears for you. Be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. So the idea that God's word is life-giving is clear in the way God's word itself describes the word. Like there are different metaphors such as Um, The word being like light, being like water, being like food, right? All of these things that we understand humans and other living things on our planet actually need to be able to grow. We believe that God's word created all things, right? He spoke and it came into being. We believe that God's word recreates things. We also believe that when you get to the end of the story, Jesus will speak. It will be his word that will finally defeat evil. And so we believe in the power of God's word. It is life-giving and life-sustaining. And so to really understand that metaphor, to think of eating this book, we're going to look today at a couple of the times in the scripture where this phrase is used. So I'm not this clever. The title, Eat This Book, actually came from the Bible. So the first place that we encounter this as a command is in the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a prophet to God's people. He's a prophet at a time when it's not very good for the Lord's people. They continually keep disobeying God. They continually go astray from the promises that they made to him, right? So God is calling them unfaithful and rebellious and saying, if you will come back to me, you get to experience the life that I really intended for you to have. Friends, the same is true for us. We get to experience the abundant life found in Christ, if we would really return to his word and let it be our life, our guide. So Ezekiel chapter 2, this is God calling him as a prophet. He says, you son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. 
Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me, and in it was a scroll. Now, the word here in Hebrew for scroll is the same word that could be translated book or writing. Of course, they didn't have these bound books, right? This is a relatively modern invention. So they had what we more visually identify as a scroll, but you can easily interchange that with book, and some translations do. He unrolled it before me, and on both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. This is because the people keep turning away from God, and so they are not going to receive life if they don't repent. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this book, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the book to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this book I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. The circumstances around Ezekiel are pretty dark. The circumstances that he's going to have to speak into are hard and frightening, and yet the truth of God consumed is sweet as honey in his mouth. This is a promise of God's word that we can receive this life-giving sweetness from his word. We don't often identify with the reality of what it means to eat to live. How many of you got up and ate breakfast this morning with the idea of, if I don't do this, I will die? We're not living in in the kind of society that they were living in. These people understood what it means to eat, to live, right? Because if there was a drought, if there was some kind of enemy that was overrunning them and taking their livestock and their crops, there was famine. They literally knew what it meant to starve. And so the metaphor of eating to live is powerful. I don't think most of us, and this is thankfully, most of us don't sit in that space of wondering, am I going to get to eat to live today? But what if we take it into the spiritual? What if we take it to abundant life that God is offering us? Eat to live. I think I can identify maybe if you talk to me about a little baby a baby born January 9th, 2022, that infant can't survive, right, unless someone feeds him or her. The baby doesn't drive through McDonald's across the street or just run to the grocery store. The baby is dependent on that milk or that formula being fed and receiving it. That's why Peter uses this as a metaphor in his letter to the church. In 1 Peter 2.2, he says, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow with respect to your salvation, if indeed you have tasted the kindness of God. Long for the pure milk of the word. Let's long for this book that God has given us as life-giving. So the phrase in Ezekiel is a command. Eat this book, because how are you going to speak my words if you don't ingest my words? It's a word to us today, too. Then we see the same sort of idea with the prophet Jeremiah, and we're going to spend some time in Jeremiah today. This was a book that I first really dug into, and it was about 15 years ago. I led a group of people through an inductive study that lasted five months, long enough for us to really dig into this book, to consume it, to pay attention to it, to give the Lord time to speak to us about what does this mean for my life. And during that study of of Jeremiah, I came across Jeremiah 15, 16. And I wouldn't say that I have a life verse, but these words were so real to me and so true to me that it has always been something that I repeat to myself. We're going to look at it today, Jeremiah 15, 16. But I want to back up 
to the calling of Jeremiah, who lives, he's a contemporary of these other prophets who are trying to call the people to repentance, trying to get them to live in a way that will lead to life instead of a way that's going to lead to judgment. And as he's called, the Lord has some similar things to say to him as he did to Jeremiah, uh, to Ezekiel. So he says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. I just invite you to take a minute and stick in whatever word you usually say. I'm, I'm too ignorant of the Bible. I'm too scared. I'm too worried about being rejected by people. I'm not smart enough. Whatever it is, there's an answer from the Lord. The Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. He's talking about the word of God being powerful, right? We believe the word of God is powerful. Is Jeremiah called to form an army or to be a king or a president and lead the people to uproot and destroy? No, he is called to speak the word of God because God's word is that powerful, church. It's this word of God in power that we're thinking about today. And we're thinking about how do we consume it? So around the same time that I was studying Jeremiah, literally, I had a pastor who gave me a gift, and the gift was a book titled, Eat This Book. It's a book written by Eugene Peterson. You know how sometimes it seems like you're hearing the same sort of thing from God from five different places, like you're really supposed to pay attention to this? That was the season I was in with God's Word to really be transformed, to really experience its life-giving power. And so I read this book by Peterson, and I was fascinated because he starts off the book with a story of his dog. He lived in Montana in the mountains, and his dog would go out and actually find carcasses and drag bones back to the house. And this is what he says. Anyone who has owned a dog knows the routine. He would prance and gamble playfully before us with his prize, wagging his tail, proud of his find, courting our approval. And of course, we approved. We lavished praise, telling him what a good dog he was. But after a while, sated with our applause, he would drag the bone off 20 yards or so to a more private place, usually the shade of a large moss-covered boulder, and go to work on the bone the social aspects of the bone were behind him. Now the pleasures became solitary. And I am absolutely certain that Peterson is intentional, uh, intentional about writing this sentence. Friends, there is a social, communal, celebratory, and sometimes mourning aspect of consuming the word of God together. But then there is also that personal aspect of consuming God's word together, eating his words and so he says, he gnawed the bone, turned it over and around, he licked it, he worried it. Sometimes we could hear a low rumble or growl, what in a cat would be a purr. He was obviously enjoying himself and in no hurry. After a leisurely couple of hours, he would bury it and return the next day to take it up again. An average bone lasted about a week. Does anybody have a dog that can picture the way their dog was with a bone like this? Do you get the mental picture? The dog works that bone. Sometimes it's with delight, and sometimes it's with a little consternation, right? Like there's an intensity to it. And why does Peterson include this word picture for us, this story for us? It's because in his work as a translator 
Of the ancient languages, Eugene Peterson is the man who was primarily responsible for the message version of the Bible. In his work, he had come across this word in the book of Isaiah, where you can read, the lion growls over its prey. The lion growls over its prey. Some of us have seen those documentaries, right, where the hungry lion has been trying for days to catch something and then finally captures its prey and really tears into it, right? This word for the lion growls over its prey is the same word that's used in the Hebrew for meditate on God's word. It's the same word that is used in the Hebrew. It's this word hagah. The lion, haga over its prey. When we look at it, I gave you a couple definitions so you could see some of the synonyms that they provide. It's to murmur, imagine, meditate, mourn, mutter, roar, or speak. Or in the other lexicon, it says to moan, growl, utter, muse, mutter, or meditate. Right? These are very descriptive words for how we can be intentional to consume the word of God. Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them. And when you hear the rest of Jeremiah's story, you're going to see that this is a man who is moaning. He's groaning in some cases to the Lord as he consumes the word. And yet, like Ezekiel, he senses the sweetness of God's word. So this idea that we can meditate on the word, it's like a dog with a bone. Keep that picture in your mind, like a dog with a bone. And here's our main idea for today. We want to seek transformation by savoring God's word. We want to seek transformation by savoring God's word. So Jeremiah in our story has been called... He's been called, like Ezekiel, don't listen to their words. Consume my words. I have put my words in your mouth. So when we look at that passage of his calling, he says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Friends, he has made the same offer to all who would put faith in Jesus Christ. He's with you to rescue you. He is your Savior. And he, as you meditate and consume this word, he's going to form in you a knowledge of who you are and who he is. There are times where if my mind starts to spin out on something or I get a little distracted or frustrated by situations going on in the world, what I need to do is remind myself, I know who my God is. I know who my God is. And how do I know it? because of his word, because he's revealed himself there. And so we want to be people who know we are saved, we are rescued, and he is appointed by the Lord. So our first point for today as we think about seeking this transformation by savoring the word is we even see with his example that sent people like Jeremiah and like you and I, sent people speak the Savior's words. And there's no way for us to do it without consuming those words, right? What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And how do our hearts transform? By the power of the word of God and the Holy Spirit. This is how we are transformed. What we ingest becomes what we express. Do you know this? What we ingest becomes what we express. I had a child, I had two kids, I had a child who turned orange, Did anybody else have that happen with their baby? He was about eight or nine months old, and the only things he really liked to eat were sweet potatoes, carrots, and squash. And those things are filled with beta carotene. And if you eat them, there is a condition called carotinemia. You actually can turn orange. And it was like I didn't notice it happening until suddenly I looked at Dave, and I'm like, why is he orange? And Dave said, oh, it's just what he's eating. Friends, we will express what we ingest. So if we ingest, if we consume, if we savor the word of God and take it in, that will be what we can speak and how we can live. 
right? This is our first point for today. So Jeremiah gets this call early on in the letter, and it doesn't, in the book, and it doesn't take long in the story for him to get death threats. I mean, this man is going to experience all kinds of horrible trials. He gets thrown in stocks, he gets beaten, he gets put in a pit. People are constantly out to kill him. This is why he's known as the weeping prophet. And so when we get to Jeremiah chapter 15, he's pouring his heart out to God. The words of God come to him, and he responds. There's a dialogue. And he's pouring his heart out to God. He even says earlier in chapter 15, I wish that my mother had never given me birth. He is lamenting his circumstances. We get to Jeremiah 15, 15. He says, Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Your words came and I ate them. And they were my joy and my delight. Friends, do you want to live lives like that in relationship to God and his word? where we can consume them and experience joy and delight. Jesus promised that if you obey my commands, you will have my joy. My joy will be made full and complete in you. And one of the actual ways that this occurs is when we consume and eat this book. This can be the joy and delight that holds us even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of trials. Saved people like Jeremiah, he's already been promised by God, I will rescue you, I will save you from all this trouble. Saved people are sustained with joy amid their troubles because of the word of God. We can be sustained with joy even in the midst of our struggles, but we have to be formed by the word of God to really experience that. So Jeremiah He says this beautiful thing, your words were found and I ate them. They became the joy and delight of my heart because I have been called by your name, Lord Almighty. I challenge you, friends, to memorize Jeremiah 15, 16 this week so that it might raise your faith that the word of God actually could be your joy and delight. If you don't have that relationship with God's word today, would you believe on faith that it could be? So when we think about this statement, they became the joy and delight of my heart. Not his duty, but his joy and his delight. You would think that his mood might be shifting, but no. Verse 17, he continues his lament. He says, I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending? and my wound grievous and incurable. You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. These are some serious words, and maybe even like an accusation of Jeremiah speaking to the Lord. Why are you like a deceptive brook? We're talking about the word of God and his promises and his truth being life-giving and life-sustaining. And here he is looking at God and saying, that source of water, I feel like right now, I don't even know where it is. This is because the reality of our lives mean it's a wrestle, it's a struggle, it's an ongoing process for us to continually be putting ourselves in the place of receiving that truth and that encouragement. We need to continually receive that. The same man is saying, your words are the joy and delight of my heart, and then you're like a deceptive brook or stream to me. Is this even a true source? Friends, we're not going to continue in this life. I'm not a prosperity preacher I'm not going to tell you this morning that once you start to read God's word, everything is going to always be up and to the right all the time. Instead, what God's word promises to us is that in the lowest of lows, when we go back and return in just that truth, what we can do is be strengthened. 
we can be fortified. And that's exactly what God tells him in his response in verse 19. And I think this is so beautiful. The conversation between Jeremiah and God here, it's raw, it's honest. The Lord replies to him in verse 19, if you return, then I will restore you. So has Jeremiah forsaken God? No, but he's struggling in doubt. And the Lord is saying, come back to me and I'm going to restore you. Don't turn away. Before me, you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. When we are formed by truth, when we are transformed by God's word, we start to understand the difference between the precious and the worthless, don't we? We start to know the difference between the words that endure and last forever and the words that are just like wind, like vanity, as the writer of Ecclesiastes said. Because there's a lot of words in this world that do not endure forever, that do not determine who we are or who are, what our future is, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so we want to be able to extract that precious from the worthless. He says, they for their part may turn to you. So he's basically telling them, Don't, I'm not guaranteeing you that this job I've given you is even going to be successful. I'm calling for your obedience and for you to find joy in my words spoken to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Then I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. And though they fight against you, they will not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you. You know, if you have faith in Jesus, you have received the same promise from the Lord. I am with you to save you and deliver you. I will strengthen you. These are the promises of God's word that we can be fortified with. He uses that word fortified like a wall of bronze. I always think about fortified like vitamins, right? Like you take this extra fortification because maybe your diet's not good enough. He's saying, consume my truth, my promises, my word, and you'll be fortified. You will be strong to stand against the enemy. This is our next takeaway. It's a lesson that we can apply to our lives. Scripture-formed people become strong against the enemy. And for many of us, we don't even know that we're under attack. We're just drifting and drifting. The word returns us to alignment with who we are and who the Lord is. So we need to continually ingest that word, savor it. We want to treat God's word like we're a dog with a bone, consuming it, growling over it, murmuring with it, in relationship with the Lord. How many times have you left church on a Sunday, inspired about something, encouraged by something, convicted, maybe redirected, and by Wednesday it's kind of faded, and by Sunday you come back and nothing's changed, and so your faith that God's word can change you just continues to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. We weren't meant to eat one meal a week at 1030 on Sundays, church. We need to continually savor the scriptures. They need to become a part of us to experience that kind of transformation. I think about performance athletes, right? They eat intentionally so that their body is going to be prepared for whatever challenges they put their body through. What about when you get to work on Monday morning and there's that person that's a challenge for you? Was your last meal on Sunday morning? What about when you're tired at the end of the week and you just don't want to give any energy to your loved ones? Right? These are the temptations. These are the challenges that come at us. And so if we can be intentional about consuming God's word, being formed by God's word, we can stand strong against that opposition that we don't even know sometimes. I don't even know what challenges I'm going to encounter every day, to be honest. And so every day, I want to be intentional to consume 
God's word, to consume this truth that forms me and strengthens me and makes me like a fortified wall of bronze. When I don't feel it, I go back to the word so that I can reaffirm this is who I am and who he is. Scripture-formed people become strong against the enemy. Another lesson from Jeremiah for us today. A man who consumed the words of God and found joy and delight. Church, I'm challenging you to savor the scripture so that you experience transformation. And to do that, you have to engage with the Holy Spirit. So in the fall, we taught about the Holy Spirit for a while. We taught how the Holy Spirit is our source of wisdom and truth and strength and help. So when we get into the scriptures, when we get into the Bible, we have to engage with the Holy Spirit. Peterson, in his book, talks about a practice called Lectio Divina. Some of you have maybe done this. Some of you have maybe never heard of it. It is from Latin. It means literally divine reading. Divine reading. He says about divine reading, he says, it is the wise guidance developed through the centuries of devout Bible reading to discipline us, the readers of Scripture, into appropriate ways of understanding and receiving this text so that it is formative, of savoring it, consuming it, ingesting it. He goes on and says, This is for the way we live our lives, not merely making an impression on our minds or feelings. It intends the reading of Scripture to be a permeation of our lives. In another place, he uses the metaphor of sucking on a lozenge until it's gone, of really letting that attention be given. And so Lectio Divina, people describe it different ways with different steps. I'm going to say here's five parts to it that are going to be on the screen for you. This is not something that has to be done um, in a real formal process. If you pick a book of Scripture, if you pick a book, I would say if you're not reading anywhere, pick a gospel and start reading a couple of paragraphs a day. And then we're intentional to savor it to sit with it, to read it in the Spirit. So when you read it, you read it closely and carefully. You pay attention. You notice. And as you're noticing, that's what we would call the meditation part of it. You're actually noticing and asking God to show you sort of what jumps out at me. Is there a word here that I keep seeing repeated? Is there a phrase that seems to apply to what's going on in my life right now? And as you do that, you're praying, you're asking God, what are you showing me in this passage today? What are you showing me? Whatever the Holy Spirit, sometimes people will describe it like there's a phrase or a word that seems to sort of jump off the page. Sometimes they'll say, there's this thing in there, and I just kept going back to it. I wasn't sure what it means for me. You know, that's the Holy Spirit. And so you enter into a time of asking God, what do you have for me? The contemplation piece is asking him, how do you want me to respond? Holy Spirit, how do you want me to realign my thoughts, my actions? Who do you want me to talk to? What do you want me to do today? Then you actually do it. That's transformation, right? This is transformation. It doesn't have to be a lot of reading. I know some of you are great at reading three or four chapters a day. And others of you have given up on ever reading because that is so much. I'm going to encourage you and challenge you to start small, but savor it. Start small, but savor it. Peterson writes this... um, book and includes the story of how the women, after Jesus' crucifixion, you know, they waited through the Sabbath day, but as soon as the Sabbath day was over, they went out to the tomb with spices to anoint and prepare his body, because this was the appropriate thing to do for a dead person. But when they get there, they encounter an angel who says, why do you look for the living among the dead? Right? He is not here. He has risen And Peterson equates this to the way some of us go to Scripture or encounter Scripture here on a Sunday morning like we're doing a post-mortem. Friends, 
Jesus is alive. The word of God is alive. This is what we're promised in Hebrews 4, right? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, so that we can discern what's going on with the attitudes of our hearts. Savor the scriptures like a dog with a bone. Ingest it so this is what you express in your life, and we will be changed. We do it together, and we do it as individuals. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, God, for your revelation. Lord, we're grateful for your Holy Spirit who dwells with us, who teaches us, who gives us understanding and wisdom. And Lord, we don't want to approach your word like a dead letter like we're doing some kind of post-mortem exam. Instead, we want to be in relationship with you through your word. We want to consume it and be changed by it. God, would you give your people a hunger for your word? Will you help raise our faith that indeed we can find joy and delight in your word? that it will be life-giving and life-sustaining, that we can go as sent people speaking your words, that, Lord, we would also be fortified and strengthened by your word for every scenario of life. God, in this time, will you speak to us? We pray this in your name. Amen. Joy in this 
So church, I'm going to be praying for you and praying for us this week that we would really savor the word of God. And I also have challenged you to memorize Jeremiah 15, 16, but also you may have caught that on the app and the website right now, there are some different Bible reading plans and ways to help you get in the word. Otherwise, call me or send me an email. I always want to be here to help equip you for that part of your life. I'm going to put that utensil in your hand. So, blessing for today is from Psalm 34. As we savor the word of God, I pray, church, that you would taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Amen. Be blessed today. And if you need prayer, I would be happy to pray with you today.